Thank you, David. Well, my name is, oops. My name isn't oops. My name is Jason. <laughs> oops, I dropped my water bottle. It's my privilege to welcome you to Pleasant View. I'm one of the pastors on staff, um, and it's my privilege to bring the word to you today. Um, it's a weird topic at Christmas, but we're going to talk a little bit about death. Uh, death has been a, a increasing component in my life in the last two years. Um, uh, my, my, my first good friend that we made when we moved here from Hawaii was John Pasika, and about two years ago, the Lord took him home. Um, about a year later, so a, a year ago, my grandmother um, went home to glory to be with her Savior and her husband, who she had been looking forward to being reunited with for a long time, but that was hard. And in the year since my grandmother has passed, uh, the gentleman who introduced my wife and I, in a way, he was both of our college advisor, and it was in being his TA that I met my wife. Um, he was an amazing, amazing example of a godly man who was working in the sciences to the glory of the Lord, and he became a very good friend. Um, he recently passed away. Um, Jim Boffman, the pastor at Bethel Baptist Church in Pearson, he and I had become friends. He is now in heaven. And then just about two weeks, uh, maybe a little bit longer than that, maybe three weeks ago now, uh, the best friend I ever had in Hawaii when we lived there, Scott Yamashita, um, uh, he just passed, and he went to be in heaven with the Lord. So there's been a lot of death in my last two years, and it's been increasingly so. The deaths are coming more frequently. And, and so it's on my heart, it's on my mind, and I, I hope you're okay talking about death a little bit here at Christmas. It's an odd combination, um, but they do actually relate to each other quite a bit. And so I'm going to actually let uh, Nicholas Cage introduce the first point of our sermon today. You know the truth. That's all that matters. You heard the story from Grandpa Charles. The story. This guy has got evidence. He's got everything. We have a story. We have nothing. For one brief moment, the Gates family can hold its head up. Now we're a bunch of crazies. But we're not liars. Look, Wilkinson is saying that Thomas Gates was a mastermind in one of the darkest hours in U.S. history, and he burned the diary page to cover that up. And you and I both know he burned the page to keep Booth's men from finding a treasure, and that's what we're going to prove. There's only one way to prove it. You have to find the treasure. You've got to find it, and you're going to help me find it. So come on, let's hear the story again from Grandpa Charles. Grandpa heard his father say, treasure map. Then there was a commotion. Okay, and I've got all that. Was there anything after that, anything he said, something he did, anything at all? Wait a minute. What? He took his son's hand, he looked him in the eye, and he said, with his dying breath, the debt that all men pay. The debt that all men pay? The debt that Thomas paid. Well, that's five letters. Try death. What? It's the key code. The debt that all men pay is death. And so if you haven't seen National Treasure 2, at this point they fly to Paris and eventually they wind up in the Black Hills of South Dakota finding huge amounts of treasure. I've been there, it's um, not there, but that's okay. <laughs> that clip is important because uh, the first point of today's sermon is that death is the debt that all men owe. I, I'm going to be delivering to you uh, my thesis, which is that God, who cannot lie, die, or fail, promised to solve the debt, that, uh, the debt of death that all men owe. Only through the incarnation can this promise be kept. So we're going to deal with first the ubiquitous nature of death, that death is the debt that all men owe. Scripture is very clear um, that 
our physical death, the fact that we all die, is a consequence of the spiritual death that began with Adam. Uh, this is actually, I think, one of the strongest arguments for a young earth is that nothing should have died, but we now all do. And death is a consequence of, physical death is a consequence of spiritual death. Genesis chapter 3 records the curse when Adam and Eve had just fallen, and this is God's response. He's, it says in Genesis 3, 14 through 19, the Lord God said to the serpent, because you have done this, cursed are you above all livestock and above all beasts of the field. On your belly you shall go and dust, dust you shall eat all the days of your life. I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. And here is a verse we're going to dwell on a little bit. He, the offspring of the woman, shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. That's been called the proto-euangelion or the first good news, the first piece of the gospel. To the woman, he says, I will surely multiply your pain in childbearing. In pain, you shall bring forth your children. Your desire shall be contrary to your husband, but he shall rule over you. And to Adam, he said, because you have listened to the voice of your wife and have eaten of the tree of which I commanded you, you shall not eat it. Cursed is the ground because of you. In pain, you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you, and you shall eat the plants of the field. By the, by the sweat of your face, you shall eat bread till you return to the ground, for out of it you were taken. For you are dust, and to dust you shall return. Physical death, which we will all ex experience. The, uh, the statistics on physical death are staggering. Every person born dies. There have only been two notable exceptions. And uh, unless the Lord returns and raptures his church, we will all experience that as well. Physical death is a consequence of spiritual death. Our New Testament scriptures are quick to move to the, uh, from the inescapable fact of our mortality due to sin to the freedom that Christ has wrought, and that's good. That's the point of Christianity. But we're going to settle just for a little bit on the bad news. So here's the bad news. You will die. I heard of a doctor who had on his, on his wall... Um, scriptures relating to the universality of death, some of which we will read here, and said underneath it, I do my best, but eventually you will die. And uh, what a testimony to his patience. Romans chapter 5, verses 12 and 13 says, Therefore, just as sin came to the world through one man, and death through sin, and so death spread to all men because all have sinned. Explicitly stated, physical death is a consequence of spiritual death. Romans 6.23, the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. And we rejoice in the second part of that, but we're going to settle for a little bit in the first part of that. 1 Corinthians 15, 21 through 22, for as by a man came death, by a man has come also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so as in Christ shall all be made alive. And lastly, Hebrews 9.27, this is, this is the verse that the doctor had on his wall. And just as it is appointed for a man to die once, and after that comes judgment. Even in this verse, that doesn't specifically say sin causes death. It says explicitly that after death, we're going to deal with sin. We would like to think that we'll go on forever. We'd like to think that blood pressure pills and Botox will assist us in pushing that back. But there is no escaping the inevitable. Professor, conservationist, writer, and statesman Wallace Earl Stenger was asked uh, about his accomplishments in his life, and he was not a Christian. This was his summation of what it means to live and to die. He says, I would like to think that one life is enough, and that when I see it coming to an end, I can meet the darkness with resignation and perhaps acceptance. I've been lucky. I came from nowhere. I had no reason to expect as much from the one life as I have got. I owe God a death, and the earth a pound or so of chemical. 
Now let's see if I can remember that when the time comes. What a heartless, hopeless, resigned state of existence. Other deep thinkers have come to similar conclusions. I'm just remembering now, it's not in the slides, but Neil deGrasse Tyson, probably one of the smartest people currently alive, uh, he was asked what his hope is after death, and he said that he will decompose and feed the next generation of flora and fauna. There's hope in death. Robert Louis Stevenson says, sooner or later, everyone sits down to a banquet of consequences. Death comes for every man. And so I've built a grave here next to the manger. And that's an odd Christmas decoration. I, I don't recommend that for the front of your home. But it is true that the tomb waits for everyone. Here's some graves of significant spiritual leaders. Here's the mosque that Abraham uh, is buried in. Mosque and Abraham, maybe you're having a moment of understand, not understanding why. Well, Abraham, if you remember in Genesis, bought a cave in which to bury his wife. And he wound up burying his sons there and himself. All of them are in the cave at Machpelah. When that area was conquered by, by uh, Muslims, they put a mosque over the top of it because they venerate Abraham as well. Uh, Isaac and Jacob, not so much, but Abraham. And so you can go into this mosque, and here behind this golden gate is the tomb of Abraham. There lies the father of three faiths, but he died. He died because he was a sinner. And there his body lies, and his death does nothing for me. He died because he was a sinner. Moses, another great man of faith, we don't know where he was buried, because again, in Exodus, it records uh, that, uh, sorry, not in Exodus, in um, Deuteronomy, it records his death, and he went up onto a mountain and died, and the Lord buried him. So no idea where that grave is, but we have a monument erected somewhere on the mountain that uh, his death occurred on, and so it's a marker in his memory, but certainly not his grave. And again, he died because while he was God's friend, he was also a sinner, and his death occurred, and his death does nothing for me. One more, David, the great king of Israel, the one to whom was given so many promises, the Davidic covenant is wrapped up in his life. This is his supposed grave. Nobody's actually sure where David's grave is. This is at least one possible candidate. But here people can go to commemorate King David. David, while he was a man after God's own heart, he was a sinner, and he died. And there he is, maybe, and his death does nothing for me. They are all dead. All of the graves point to their accomplishments in life, but nothing more. These two paid the debt that all men owe, and they paid it for themselves. We have to realize that that is true of you and I as well. Debt is the, death is the debt that all men owe. In contrast to that, God is the wellspring of life, and that is my second point. God is the wellspring of life. We decorate our homes this season of year with evergreen things because in the midst of a bleak winter landscape, there are things that still look alive and vibrant. And there's a whole lot of history behind the Christmas tree that is not the point of today's sermon. But we bring living things into our home when most things look dead and say, yay, life. And that helps us think about God who brings life God is in himself alive. God is the source of all life. In Genesis, God creates fish and birds and bugs in Genesis 1.20. And he creates land animals in Genesis 1.24. And then Genesis 1.26, he gets down to creating us. Then God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. And let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the heavens, and over, lost my place, uh, the livestock, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. 
So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him male and female, he created them. It goes on in Genesis chapter 2, verse 7, to describe it in a little more detail. It says, then the Lord God formed man of the dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living creature. Our life finds its source in God. This is stated all throughout the Bible, numerous places. I'm just going to show you a handful more to make sure you know that it's not just in Genesis that we get this idea. Psalm chapter 36 verse 9 says, For with you is the fountain of life. They were searching for that in South America. It's in the wrong location. It's in God, the fountain of life. In your light do we see light. Here the psalmist combines life and light and John the Beloved riffs on that theme when he's introducing Jesus to us in the beginning of his gospel. John chapter 1 says, In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. Later on in John's gospel, he records the words of Jesus, where Jesus says, As explicitly as he can, in him, sorry, uh, John five twenty six. For the Father has life in himself. He is life. And so he has granted the Son to also have life in himself. It is a part of the innate nature of the Godhead that there is life. As the source of life, as life itself, it is impossible for God to die. We don't like to talk about God having impossibilities but it is impossible for God to die. God is life. Exodus chapter 314, God says to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, say this to the people of Israel, I am has sent you. I am is the present tense form of the verb to be. God says to Moses, I am. As far back in history as you look, I am still there. As far forward into the future as you can look, I am. I am still there. And if you could unplug yourself from time and be in the realm of eternity where God alone dwells rightly, there I am as well. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 15 says, He who is blessed and the only sovereign, the King of kings and Lord of lords, who alone has immortality, who dwells in unapproachable light, whom no one has ever seen or can see, to him be honor and eternal dominion. Amen. God alone has immortality. Every other being in the universe is contingent upon him. Our life began and will continue forever because God wills it so. You don't have eternal life within yourself as a part of your nature, but God does. All things are possible with God, but there are three things that he cannot do. He cannot lie, according to Numbers 23, 19. He cannot die, according to Revelation 1, 8. And he cannot fail, according to John 10, 35. And so there's a little bit of a problem Because we have this debt of death that all men owe. And God promised in the same monologue where he brought death to us, in that speech, he promises to solve the problem. He promises to pay the debt of death that he is laying on humanity as he's laying it on humanity. And how can he do that? He cannot die. He can't simply say, oh, never mind, I was kidding, because God cannot lie. He can't purpose to pay the death debt and then not do it because he cannot fail. So what can God do? If death is the debt that all men owe, and if God cannot die, then he cannot pay man's debt as God. And we have a problem. Which brings us to the third point, the death of God. God must add to his divinity humanity in order to keep his promise. 
God must add to his divinity humanity in order to keep his promise. John Calvin says it better than I can. And so here's a quote from John Calvin's Institutes. He says, finally, since as God, only he could not suffer. As God only, and it's weird to say only God, but as purely divine, he could not suffer. And as man only could not overcome death. You and I cannot overcome death. As men, we have a debt that all men owe. He united the human nature with the divine that he might subject the weakness of the one to death as an expiation of sin. We pay for sin by letting humanity die. And by the power of the other, maintaining a struggle with death might gain us the victory. We have to wrap divinity in humanity so that the humanity can die and pay the debt, but the divinity cannot be conquered by the death, and so we get eternal life and by so doing, conquer death. Classic Christmas passages have known this for a long time. 700 years before it was enacted, Isaiah 7.14 said, Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. This is no ordinary man. This is somebody born of a virgin, and it echoes back in the mind of every Jew who hears that passage to Genesis 3.15, that the solution comes in the seed of a woman. And also the word Emmanuel, which while it was probably the given name to a young boy that Isaiah was talking about in his immediate context, Emmanuel means God is with us, and Matthew is sure to translate that for us in Matthew chapter 2, so that we know that not only is this the seed of the woman, but it is God in flesh. Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6, just two chapters later, says, For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulders. And his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and his peace there will be no end. On the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and to uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time forth and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. The coming Messiah is explicitly divine. He's mighty God. He's everlasting Father. And his kingdom will be forever. Nobody's kingdom is forever. Messiah's kingdom will be forever. Only God can have an unending kingdom. Micah chapter 5 verse 2, another famous Christmas passage but you, O Bethlehem Ephrata, who are too little to be among the clans of Judah, from you shall come forth from me one who is to be ruler in Israel, whose coming forth is from old and from ancient of days. The coming Messiah's personhood reaches back into eternity past. Only God exists in eternity past. And Isaiah 9, 7, his kingdom re reaches into eternity future. Only one being can be from eternity future to eternity past. The scriptures knew that God would have to add humanity to himself. Did this expectation bear out in the person of Jesus Christ? Was he a man with divine origin? Did you know that the 27 books of the New Testament are only written by nine people? Nine people wrote a total of 27 books that find themselves in our New Testament. Every single New Testament author attested to the divinity of Jesus Christ. I'm just going to give you one passage from each of the nine authors. Please understand that this list could be much longer, but there's a clock on the back wall. Matthew chapter 1, verse 23 says, Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. And there's that reference where he's quoting Isaiah but he's very explicitly making sure we know that Jesus is God. Mark chapter 1, verses 9 through 11. In those days, Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And when he came up out of the water, immediately he saw the heavens being opened and the Spirit descending on him like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, You are my beloved Son. With you I am well pleased. 
We don't necessarily in our culture identify sons and fathers as being of one substance, but that was definitely a clear understanding in the, in the first century. So to describe somebody as your son means they are your essence. You are identical in nature. And here we have Mark clearly attesting to Christ's divinity. Luke chapter 1 verse 35, the angel answered her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. Very explicit language. John is probably the, uh, the evangelist who uses this idea the most. So just picking one reference from John's writing, John chapter 1, verse 14, the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. No room for argumentation, no word for grammatical backflips. God in flesh with us. Paul wrote a huge swath of the New Testament. And just picking one reference from Paul, Colossians chapter 1, verses 15 through 17. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. A good persuasive speaker likes to anticipate the arguments and the pushbacks and the rebuttals of his challengers and address the answers before the questions are given. I feel like that's what Paul was doing here. He's scratching his head and saying, what else might they say? Oh, yeah. And he keeps adding more clauses to make sure that there's no question. Jesus is God. James, a brother of Jesus, raised in the same home as Jesus. I imagine he knew his brother well. James did not believe that Jesus was God until after the resurrection, and he got a unique visit from the resurrected Lord. After that, he understood that his brother was more than just his brother. James chapter 2, verse 1 says, My brothers... Show no partiality as you hold faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory. The Lord of glory is a specific term used uniquely for God the Father in the Old Testament. James, a good Jew who knew not to blaspheme, used a proper title for Yahweh and pointed at his brother and said, that is God. Second Peter chapter 1, the leader of the apostles Simon Peter, a servant and apostle of Jesus Christ to those who have obtained a faith of equal standing with ours by the righteousness of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Jehovah's Witnesses would like you to try to draw a big heavy line between God and Savior and say Peter's talking about two people. There's God and then there's the Savior, but the Greek grammar doesn't allow for that. The structure of the sentence demands that God and Savior both point to the same object. And so Jesus Christ is God and Savior. Jude. Jude is another brother of Jesus whose writings got into the New Testament. Jude, verses 4 and 5. This is maybe the most audacious statement about the divinity of Christ in the New Testament. It says, For certain people have crept in unnoticed who long ago were designated for condemnation, ungodly people who pervert the grace of our God into sensuality, and deny our only master and Lord, again, only master would definitely be pointing to Yahweh, the God of the Old Testament, and he says, that's Jesus Christ, my brother. And then this next sentence, now I want to remind you, although you once fully knew it, that Jesus, who saved a people out of the land of Egypt, afterward destroyed those who did not believe. Good Jewish boy went to Hebrew school. Pretty much every day they talked about the Exodus. That's where the, the blooming of their society occurred. Who led them out of Egypt? God, Yahweh. Jude puts his brother's name in there. Jesus led them out of Egypt. 
Hebrews chapter 1. We're not sure who wrote the, uh, the epistle to the Hebrews. Uh, whoever did it had an amazing command of the Greek language. This is the highest caliber Greek in the New Testament. Hebrews chapter 1 verse 3. He is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature. And he upholds the universe by the word of his power. After making purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. No room for argumentation or debate or misunderstanding of what the authors of the New Testament meant. Every single author of the New Testament attested to the fact that Jesus Christ was God, that God had come and added to his divinity humanity. So how does this help the undying God who cannot lie or be defeated keep his word to accomplish his purpose of paying the debt that all men owe? We're going to settle on Galatians chapter 4, verses 4 and 5. Galatians 4, 4 and 5. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law so that we might receive adoption as sons. So here the undying God has wrapped his eternal divinity in humanity. Notice he was born of a woman. Again, this should point you back to Genesis 3.15. This is the seed of a woman. Everybody Everybody's born of a woman. I'm born of a woman. Shad's born of a woman. My dad's born of... We're all born of women. But Paul mentions this here because he is the one born of a woman. Uniquely, the seed of the woman, the virgin-born God-man. Genesis 3.15, remember, it says, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and... And her offspring, the her offspring there, is Messiah. And Paul says, it's that guy, born of the woman. Genesis, sorry, Galatians 4 says he was born under the law, by which all men must die. Just, to, just so you know, the reason he added skin to divinity, the reason he accepted humanity to be added to his divinity was so that he could die. If he had come down in some kind of Christophanic, you know, angel of the Lord Old Testament experience, and if, they, if that manifestation of the Godhead had somehow looked like it died, that would not have paid the price of sin because we need humanity to pay the price of sin. He was born under the law. He alone lived without sin. And he alone, of all men, born of women, did not need to die for his own sin. Abraham died because he was a sinner. Moses died because he was a sinner. David died because he was a sinner. I will die physically because I am a sinner. 1 John 3, 5. You know that he appeared in order to take away sins, and in him there is no sin. So Jesus stepped in and wrapped himself in humanity so that he could die, even though he didn't personally owe that debt. Galatians 4 says he came to redeem those under the law. He came to keep his promise made 4,000 years before to Eve, to the mother of all the living. He came as a second Adam to undo the work of the first Adam. Which leads us to our final point that I'm calling a Christmas hallelujah. When the magnitude of the love of God, as demonstrated in the length to which he went to keep his promise and accomplish his purpose, is understood, it's only fitting to explode in worship. Paul did this lots of times. I'm going to read you one of them. If you've read Romans all in one go, if you haven't, you should. It'll take you a bit of time, but, but I, I think we sometimes walk through that book in little tiny steps so we understand every bite, but we miss the gorgeousness of the buffet. After dealing with how God solves the problem of sin for Jews and Gentiles, 
for 11 chapters. At the end of Romans 11, Paul is so excited he can't contain himself. He says, oh, the depths and the riches of the wisdom and the knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments. How inscrutable are his ways. If you read that as a pompous, pious, boring person, you've missed the point. Paul doesn't know how to use bigger words. All of heaven worships Jesus because of his extravagant love shown through his humiliation and his suffering in our place. I'm going to read you the entire Romans, uh, sorry, entire Revelation 5, the whole chapter. It's not very long. At the end, I want to pretend that we've, pre that we've rehearsed a responsive reading. I'll tell you when to start reading with me. It'll be on the screen. This is heaven's response to what Jesus has done. And it has to be our response too, or you don't get it. Revelations chapter 5, starting in verse 1. Then I saw in the right hand of him who was seated on the throne a scroll written within and on the back, sealed with seven seals. And I saw a mighty angel proclaiming with a loud voice, who is worthy to open the scroll and break its seals? And no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or to look into it. And I began to weep loudly because no one was found worthy to open the scroll or look into it. And one of the elders said to me, weep no more. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has conquered so he can open the scroll and its seven seals. And between the throne and the four living creatures and among the elders, I saw a lamb standing as though it had been slain with seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. And when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the lamb, each holding a harp and a golden bowl full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song saying, would you read that with me? Worthy are you to take the scroll and to open its seals for you were slain and by your blood you ransomed people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. And you have made them a kingdom and priests to our God and they shall reign on the earth. Then I looked, and I heard around the throne and the living creatures and the elders the voice of many angels, numbering myriads of myriads and thousands of thousands, saying with a loud voice, read this with me, Worthy is the Lamb who is slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. And I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and in the sea and in all that is in them saying, read this with me, to him who sits on the throne and to the lamb be blessing and honor and glory and might forever and ever. And the four living creatures said, amen. And the elders fell down and worshiped. There's a song that was made famous by, by Pentatonix called Hallelujah. And the version that they made famous, the lyrics are just weird. If you've ever read the lyrics uh, tied to a kitchen chair with your hair cut off, like it's bizarre. Um, but then somebody else, and I try to find the, the author who kept the melody and rewrote the words, but they did a beautiful job creating a actually Christian Christmas song called A Christmas Hallelujah. So I'm going to sing that song with you. And the chorus is really simple. You've probably heard the song on the radio, right? Have you heard the pentatonics version on the radio? Yeah? Okay, good. It just goes, hallelujah, hallelujah, right? You'll recognize it if you don't know what I'm talking about yet. When we do, would you just join us in singing that? I'm going to sing these new lyrics to you for the verse and then invite you to join in a Christmas hallelujah.
I heard about this baby boy who came to earth to bring us joy. And I just want to sing this song to ya. It goes like this, the fourth, the fifth, the minor fall, the major lift. With every breath I'm singing hallelujah. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. A couple came to Bethlehem Expecting child, they searched the end to find a place for you were coming soon. There was no room for them to stay, so when a manger filled with hay, God's only son was born, oh, hallelujah, hallelujah. Shepherds left their flocks by night to see this baby wrapped in light. A host of angels led them all to ya. It was just as the angel said, you'll find a man, a manger bed, Emmanuel and Savior, hallelujah. Rescue me, this baby boy would grow to be a man and one day die for me and you. The sins were brave, the nails in you, that rugged cross was my cross too, that every breath you drew was hallelujah. going to invite you to respond in the greatest hallelujah possible. You have one life. You've been given one life, and poor Professor Stengel had no idea what to do with his. If you have not yet done what the elders of heaven do, and laid all that you are at the foot of the cross, at the feet of the lamb who was slain for you, would you do that this morning? We're going to have communion here in a minute. And communion is only for believers. It's a celebration of divinity wrapped in humanity and killed for you. The debt that all men own has been paid on your behalf by God who loved you enough to do that. If you are not yet one of his people, would you make that change in your life today? There is a, a, a tradition in, in churches to lead you in a prayer 
And the words are not magical. The words do nothing in and of themselves if they are not borne along by your honest repentance and turning from sin and embracing the Savior. But if you need to do that, it's a good vehicle to drive your mind in the right direction. So if you have not yet ever expressed your gratitude to the God who died for you, I'm going to give you an opportunity to follow me in prayer in a moment, and then the praise team is going to sing while the elements are distributed. And maybe this would be your first morning to rightly take communion as one of the children of God. Uh, Christians, so that you can help others be more comfortable in this moment if they have never prayed this, would you just pray this out loud as well as support and, and going with them before the throne of grace? Would you close your eyes, please? Let's come before the Lord. If you need to give your life to Jesus, would you pray this, please, after me? Say, Dear Jesus, I know that I'm a sinner. I believe that you are God. Thank you for paying my debt of death. Thank you for rising again and conquering the grave. Forgive me of my sin. Give me the strength to live for you. From now and forever. 